The Atlanta Falcons are reshuffling the roster and mining the XFL for depth. Now we'll talk about who has the best chance of making the roster from their recent roster additions and why this team may not be done making roster moves this summer. You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So guys, you know me, I'm Aaron Freeman, a.k.a. Mr. Drew, a.k.a. Sirius Black, and of course, the very humble host of this illustrious Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. And I've heard from some of you guys that don't like how often I use the term illustrious. Well, too bad. It's only illustrious guests, as we'll have one later on today's episode and Brad Spielberger of Pro Football Focus to talk with us a little bit about positional value, what his thoughts were on the Falcons draft, and some uh, other roster moves that they may be able to make with Marcus Peters bringing him into the building, as well as Brad giving us his thoughts on what an A.J. Terrell contract extension might look like a year from now. But, you know, I want to thank everyone that makes this illustrious podcast their first listen. Uh, shout out to all my everydayers that subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast, follow in their footsteps so that you can get the latest episode as soon as it is available. But we'll be talking about the roster moves that the Falcons did make to start out today's episode here on this illustrious Lockdown Falcons podcast. And they made a flurry of moves after the rookie minicamp. We've talked before on this podcast that we could, you know, suspected that we would see the team make some moves after their rookie mini camp uh, and reshuffle things. And that's been a trend the last couple of years. We've seen a number of players that the Falcons have added in May, June, and, and later go on to contribute to this team. Parker Hesse, Brian Edwards, Jalen Dalton, Bradley Pinion, Nick Kwiatkowski are some examples of players that were added in May, June, between the draft and the start of training camp that wound up contributing to the Falcons. And we'll see if any of these new guys can be added to that list. Uh, if you missed the news, the Falcons added eight players, uh, signing three guys from the XFL and safety Lucas Dennis, uh, defensive tackle LaCale London, and offensive tackle Barry Wesley. They signed three undrafted free agents and quarterback Austin Oni out of North Texas, uh, defensive back slash corner Natron Brooks out of Southern Miss, and uh, defensive back slash corner of Clifford Chapman out of uh, Texas San Antonio. They signed two street free agents in Andre Smith, the linebacker, formerly with the Tennessee Titans, and Slade Bolden, the wide receiver, formerly of Alabama, and I think he was most recently with the Ravens as an undrafted free agent. And to make room for those guys, they cut uh, seven guys in edge rusher David Anini, uh, cornerbacks Javelin Guidry, Matt Hankins, and Dylan Mabin, wide receiver Rashawn Henry, offensive tackle Jermaine Fetty and fullback slash tight end John Rainey. They also put B.J. Baylor, the running back. They waived him injured, so he will be going to injured reserve uh, after clearing waivers with an undisclosed injury. Uh, so let's talk about the cuts first. And, you know, most of those guys that the Falcons wind up cutting were guys that were assigned to futures deal after the season that were on the practice squad last season. The most notable of those guys that didn't fit that description is Jermaine Effetti. And if you listen to my 53-man roster production a week or two ago on the podcast, I did not project Effetti to make the roster. Uh, and we talked about how Wentz, you know, Chuma Adoga signed with the Dallas Cowboys that the Falcons had an opening at that swing tackle position because it goes back to why the Falcons signed Adoga in the first place way back in August last September of last year, which was due to Effetti's limitations, the fact that he could only play uh, on the right side or only had experience playing on the right side of the offensive line, playing guard and tackle, limited Effetti to be that swing tackle where you need a guy to have that experience to step in at not only left tackle, but also right tackle. Effetti also only played eight snaps in 2022 and was the one exception uh, compared to, comparatively to the rest of the Falcons offensive line that didn't perform well again obviously a very small sample size but really struggled to hit his assignments on those eight snaps that he did play in 2022 and it just kind of felt like the falcons re-signing him was perfunctory right it was like well we we need somebody at that tackle spot and let's just bring back jermaine Fetty, even if we know that he doesn't solve the problem that we need 
it to solve, which is why the Falcons, you know, went out and got Adoga in the first place last year, right? And and let Adoga walk in free agency. So, um, you know, now that the Falcons brought in Wesley, who I believe was the highest graded left tackle in the XFL uh, this past spring, they brought in Joshua Miles, who they notably uh, guaranteed two hundred million of his one million dollar uh, base salary when they signed him, uh, formerly of the Arizona Cardinals, and. You know, you compare that to the amount of guaranteed money they, they gave Afedi. They gave Afedi zero guaranteed dollars on top of his signing bonus, um, despite the fact that Joshua Miles had only 24 career regular season snaps, uh, you know, going into this year. That kind of was the writing on the wall that the Falcons were not necessarily buying into Afedi. Uh, and then you also couple that with Ethan Greenidge, who they've picked up, you know, in April, uh, who also, like Afedi, can play guard, tackle, but does have the experience playing on both sides of the offensive line. Afedi essentially became expendable and the Falcons moved on. So this is a position, the swing tackle battle is going to be something that we'll keep an eye on going into training camp. It's reminiscent to me of 2017 when the Falcons went into that camp with inexperienced options like Daniel Brunskill, Andreas Nappi, Marquise Lucas. Uh, now I think this group of Miles, Greenidge, and, and Wesley are a little bit more experienced in that group, but Obviously, you have not had anybody in this group, you know, make an NFL roster and perform as a swing tackle. And ultimately, that summer, the Falcons did wind up trading a fifth round pick for Ty Sambrello. Hopefully, if the Falcons do make a subsequent move later this summer to secure a swing tackle, it will be a little bit better of an addition than that. And as often I is the case, you know, I got to keep my eyes on the Jets because, you know, I still have these dreams as as fleeting the dream as they may be that we'll see the Falcons, you know, potentially reunite Dwayne Ledford and Mackay Becton, uh, potentially if Becton doesn't necessarily uh, hold on to the starting right tackle spot that he's expected to win with the Jets this summer. So we'll keep an eye on that. We'll keep an eye on several other you know, position battles throughout the summer, especially when we get into July, when we start to see some of these 53-man roster projections talking about some of these tackles that may be on the bubble. These are guys that the Falcons may keep an eye on if one of these guys, Wesley, Miles, Greenidge, does not emerge in camp uh, as they want them to do. The other notable addition is Austin Oni, the quarterback, because it's the fourth quarterback uh, in, on the Falcons roster. And this is the first time in the Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith regime that the Falcons have carried four quarterbacks on their roster, right? We talked about this earlier this offseason, why I did not think them drafting a quarterback was likely to happen because of this um, rule, uh, or not rule, but this uh, t um, template, and that's not the right word, um, trend is the right word, uh, trend of them not caring for quarterbacks on the roster. Now, Ani is interesting because he's 29 years old. He formerly was a pitcher in the Yankees farm system, played baseball in the minor leagues for a couple of years. Then decided, you know, done with that. Um, Want to go and, and try my hand at college football, uh, you know, and eventually was able to work his way to become the starter at North Texas the last year or two. Uh, just watching some of his highlights and some of his clips, you know, seems to have a quick release that comes from that pitching background. So you can put some zip on the football, a pretty good athlete. So he's somebody worth keeping an eye on. Normally we would just say, oh, it's a fourth quarterback, whatever. But again, the fact that the Falcons are willing to basically say, no, this is the guy that we're going to now finally break the streak and bring in a fourth quarterback to me is interesting. So we'll see him push Logan Woodside to basically have the right to be the scout team quarterback throughout the season as that third string guy on the practice squad. I don't think either of these guys, unless Woodside comes out and, and balls out or on has an incredible preseason, you know, they're not going to make the roster because I doubt the Falcons will carry more than two quarterbacks on the roster with Ritter and Heineke. But you know, making the practice squad is definitely a realistic option for one of these two players. So Ani is a guy to keep an eye on just because it's unprecedented for the Falcons to have a fourth quarterback. And so they must have seen something in him that they really liked in order to take this 29 year old guy that has one or two years as a starter experience in college and say, yeah, we want to bring that guy to camp. So, uh, you know, the other notable signing uh, before we move on here is probably Andre Smith in terms of guys that can make the roster just because Andre Smith has a lot of experience playing special teams, you know, over 900 career snaps on special teams play with the, the, the Bills, the Panthers, and the Titans. Um, and so he's expected to come in and compete for a depth role at that linebacker spot, that fourth linebacker role, which, you know, Tay Davis, Nate Landman, Dorian Ethwich are, are sort of the, the top competitors at that spot. Uh, that will primarily be a special teams only role. So uh, Smith does have a, a leg up there just because of that group 
him and Tay Davis are the most experienced. But again, this linebacker position may be a, a position that we may see the Falcons circle back to in training camp uh, at a later date if certain players become available uh, to, to fill that depth, to get a more proven backup option, someone who is a little bit more experienced on defense in addition to being special teams. That's what Nick Kwiatkowski was for this team last year. They did not opt to resign him. We'll see if they maybe circle back to Kwiatkowski or someone similar later this summer. So uh, all of this, these moves are to build depth, to increase competition in camp at some of these various spots. We know that the Falcons roster building is a work in progress, and we'll see if they make any additional moves between now and the start of camp. I'm not expecting anything major, maybe a tweak here or there. Uh, but, you know, once we get to camp and if, you know, do they stand pat at some of these issues like swing tackle, linebacker depth, et cetera? Um, or, you know, do they feel content with, you know, these guys stepping up or whatever, or are they shaky and they wind up going in another direction? So, you know, we'll, we'll preach patience on this podcast as always, you know, this isn't the week that we're going to trade for Corey Davis, but th th that week may be coming, you know, a few months down the road. So we'll see how that goes, but um, we'll end the roster conversation right there. And you know, we'll move to a conversation that I promised you guys I w wasn't going to bring up on Lockdown Falcons, but I, the only person uh, that could make me talk about this specific subject, which is positional value, is Brad Spielberger of Pro Football Focus. We'll get his thoughts on positional value as well as the Falcons draft class overall as we continue today's Locked on Falcons. But guys, I want to tell you about a delicious snack that you don't have to deal with the sugar and calories that usually come with it, right? And, you know, usually when you hear about, oh, something that's healthy for you, you think it tastes bad, but that's not the case with Built Bar, the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. They're low in sugar, calories, high in protein, 17 grams of protein. They come in great flavors like peanut butter brownie, coconut almond. And for years, I tell you to go to Built.com, order yourself a mix box to try all the various flavors and use the promo code LOCKEDON15. Uh, and you'll get 15% off your order. You can still do that. Check out a mix box. Check out the limited time flavors. But you can also now go to Sam's Club or Walmart to find yourself a box of Built Bar. Walk to the pharmacy section in the Walmart and get a four-bar box of cookies and cream and double chocolate. Or you can run into Sam's and grab a 13-bar box of brownie batter puff or churro puff. You will thank me later. All right, everyone, we are back with another illustrious guest. He is none other than Brad Spielberger, who is the money man, as I call him, for Pro Football Focus. And he is back with us to talk a little bit about the Falcons draft. We talked with Brad, Brad earlier this all season about in the lead up to free agency and whatnot. And so we'll get Brad's thoughts now that the draft is over uh, about what the Falcons did this past April, as well as some other things that may be on their horizon over the course of the summer in the next year. But Brad, my friend, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me back. So let's start off talking about the thing that just recently happened, which was the NFL draft. And I'm just curious to get your overall thoughts on, on the Falcons draft hall. Yeah, I think it was a good class. You know, I think Matthew Bergeron was a name you started to hear a ton in the last month leading up to the draft. Uh, so, I, you know, threw on his tape before before we got there and really liked what I saw. I think it does make sense. Maybe he starts at left guard uh, and then is a potential tackle down the road. But either way, a good player in space, a good athlete. I mean, he's add a little bit of bulk to the bottom half, but that's kind of what, you know, NFL weight rooms are for. Um, Zach Harrison, interesting player. I think interesting because kind of different mold. I think it really shows maybe what Ryan Nielsen wants to do going forward. Not a 240-pound stand-up outside linebacker, a big, big dude, you know, more of your traditional quote-unquote defensive end, um, but a good player, productive player. Interesting kind of how he didn't have more buzz, I thought, coming out of Ohio State and all those things. Maybe didn't improve year to year as maybe some people would have liked, but you know, growth is not linear. And, and so I think an interesting pick there. And last one that I have, you know, major thoughts on Clark Phillips is awesome. You know, he fell because of size that that is the reality of the situation. Um, but I love those scrappy corners that are just, they're, they're good football players. They're instinctive. They, they play bigger than they are. Um, and, and he's all of those things. Well, I, I noticed one player you didn't talk about, which was the Falcons first round pick, which is B. John Robinson. And I'm just curious, you know, and given that you work for PFF and I'm sure we'll get into the conversation about positional value in, in that. And maybe you'll be able to explain some things that maybe I'm not quite grasping uh, on that. But what were your thoughts on the selection of Bijan Robinson in round one? 
Yeah, so it's funny you mentioned the PFF aspect. So before I even started working here, I actually wrote a book about dra- draft pick trade charts and and positional value and all those things. And the the one kind of like quote I always go back to was looking at Saquon Barkley in 2018 and then Nick Bosa in 2019. So like you mentioned, I'm the contract guy, I'm the money man. So ignoring the on field, which we'll get to, um, just looking at contracts. The minute Saquon Barkley was drafted second overall, he was a top five paid running back in the NFL. The minute Nick Bosa was drafted second overall the following year, he was the like 30th or, or 37th highest paid edge rusher. So, again, I'm not talking about, you know, I also do think edges, quote unquote, matter more or whatever you want to say. Um, but here's the thing. Bijan Robinson might be, if I had a fantasy draft 1.01 pick, I would consider taking Bijan Robinson first overall. I think he is going to have a remarkably productive career right out of the gate. Is going to be a thousand plus, 1500 yard potential type guy um, in an Arthur Smith offense that I love. The, the diversity in the run game and all the different things they do. And the offensive line looks pretty solid by retaining everyone, by adding Matthew Bergeron. So, yeah, it's, you know, look, it is obviously. Not something we view as very smart in a long-term standpoint um, from a roster construction view, uh, but he's going to be an amazingly fun player to watch, you know, starting in week one. Yeah, and does it basically boil down to the contract? Is that really what this is about? Uh, In addition to, obviously, you know, certain positions, the expectation is those things can have a, a, a bigger impact, but it's basically like I'm, I'm looking at the numbers at like overthecap.com and B. John, based off of his rookie contract, is going to be like the 15th highest paid running back in the NFL right away once he signs his deal, just a notch above what the Falcons gave Cordero Patterson when they resigned him uh, two years ago. Um, and then you compare that to, say, if the Falcons had gone in a direction to take a Christian Gonzalez at eight instead, he would be like the 36th highest paid quarter cornerback uh you know had he gotten the same contract is it just boiled down to basically you want to get those premium positions for much cheaper and because you're not doing that with a running back or any of these other non-premium positions that's why it uh that's the core argument for the whole positional value thing I think it's three prongs. So that's the one prong that I, again, because of my kind of foundation, go to that I think people kind of ignore. Uh, The second one is, you know, the the production is dependent on the surrounding circumstances. But like I mentioned, you know, again, to go back to Saquon Barkley, he goes to New York that has a terrible offensive line that does not have a great pass game. And, you know, they're picking top 10 every year of his rookie deal. I genuinely think the the foundation in place in the run game with both coaching and the offensive line is about as good as it could possibly be um, in Atlanta. And then the last piece is you look at where you can find talent at each position in the draft. So like, you know, edge tackle, you mentioned corner, which actually is not, not, you can find some good corners later on, but basically the, you know, if you're trying to find a top end edge rusher or offensive tackle or interior defensive lineman that has pass rush ability or obviously quarterback, whatever wide receiver, you find those guys in the first two rounds of the draft. Like you don't find elite edge rushers and, and, and tackles later on. Again, not it's possible, but it's very, very rare. Whereas, you know, we, we have great running backs going on day three all the time. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, for the Locked On Falcons listeners, I, I've been saying for weeks, we are not going to talk about positional value on this podcast. <laughs> so we finally talked about positional value on this podcast here. Uh, Brad, you bring out the best in me here on Locked On Falcons, but we'll continue the conversation pivoting from the draft and we'll talk about the cornerback position, kind of uh, piggybacking on that. And, and Brad wrote uh, a, a article about, you know, potential landing spots for some of the best remaining free agents and mentioned Marcus Peters uh, as a potential landing spot uh, for or the Falcons as a landing spot for Marcus Peters. And we'll touch upon that as we continue today's Locked on Falcons. So continuing today's Locked on Falcons here with Brad Spielberger of Pro Football Focus. He is, as I said, at the top, the money man over there uh, and and the go-to guy when it comes to talking contracts. We'll talk a little bit later about what A.J. Terrell's market could look like if the Falcons are looking to extend him a year from now, similar to what they did with Chris Lindstrom this past offseason. But first, I want to touch a little bit about, you know, the offseason 
is mostly wrapped up, but we know there are some prominent free agents still out there and we'll see moves made over the coming months and weeks leading up to training camp and potentially into training camp. And last week you, you pinned an article over at PFF about some of the best landing spots for some of the remaining free agents. And what stood out to me, obviously, because we're locked on Falcons, is that you put Marcus Peters uh, to the Atlanta Falcons as a great landing spot. And just curious if you could break that down further. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I think the thing first and foremost with the player himself was not great last year, but was coming off an Achilles injury. I know everyone's going to point to the age, but at a, a, a lateral agility type position, a lot of stop and start, mirroring a receiver, that injury is going to, you know, hold you back. Whether you're 20 or 30 doesn't really matter. So, um, you know, from that standpoint, you know, I, maybe it is a sign of age, but I kind of told myself, you know, maybe he has some good football left in him and it was more tied to the injury itself. Um, but then secondly, I, I love it from a standpoint point of you obviously invested a ton of resources in the front seven this offseason you know ryan nielsen comes in wants to generate pressure wants to have a rotation along the defensive line all those things you have a clear number one corner in aj terrell a lockdown guy that quarterbacks probably want to avoid um if anything and so then if you get vintage marcus peters the guy that led the nfl in interceptions for like a six or seven year stretch who makes a ton of plays on the football, who is very opportunistic. And if you have, you know, quarterbacks under duress, you have quarterbacks avoiding the A.J. Terrell half of the field, he can maybe give you some of those. Look, the defense obviously is going to be better than last year, but kind of one more piece to add to it is adding a guy that can flip the field, turn the ball over, and give you advantageous field position, can kind of, you know, clinch games or, or turn around games, make those big splash plays. That's who Marcus Peters is. And worst case, you know, he's depth behind Jeff Okuda and Mike Hughes and all those things. But I just kind of loved all the angles of how he could fit um, in this Falcons defense. Yeah, I, I think you, you made an excellent case there. Certainly, I think, you know, there are certainly some question marks about Jeff Okuda. We know the pedigree, but we just haven't quite seen it on the football field. And, you know, Marcus Peters has that proven pedigree. And as you say, if you can get past the Achilles injury, if you can get past maybe some of the personality quirks of Marcus Peters that does make him, you know, maybe high maintenance is probably the, the, the right word to use for him. Um, you know, I, I think it makes a ton of sense for the Falcons. But speaking of, you know, quarterbacks avoiding, you know, the A.J. Terrell half of the field, uh, I'm curious to pick your brain on sort of what type of money are the Falcons maybe having to have to sort of set aside for the future uh, when it comes to A.J. Terrell. We saw them give a big extension to Chris Lindstrom heading into his fourth year. This has been a common theme across the league where you give those first round picks, you pick up the fifth year option. And before you get to year five, you give them the big time extension. Chris Lindstrom became the highest paid guard in the NFL. I'm curious, is there a path where you can see AJ Terrell becoming the new highest paid cornerback in the NFL, jumping a player like Jair Alexander, or do you think he'll come in below that? No, I think he would. I think if he plays like he did in 2021, I'm not going to say he was bad last year. Uh, the team asks a lot of him. You know, corner is a very tough position to, I mean, grade, yes, but also just kind of just analyze, right? Because what is asked of different players is very different team to team and scheme to scheme. They put a lot on his plate, and he still delivers and steps up as one of the better young corners in the league. So, you know, you mentioned the fifth-year option. Uh, I mentioned 2021 because he probably should have made the Pro Bowl. He didn't, so his option is not as, as valuable as it could have been. Um, but it should realistically just be a placeholder nevertheless. Um, he shouldn't play on it. If he has another good season in 2023, yeah, I would actually be surprised if he doesn't become the highest-paid corner. Uh, it's kind of a stagnant market. Yeah, you mentioned Jair Alexander at, what, $21 million, but Jalen Ramsey hit 22 off-seasons before that. We haven't really had, like, a guy come up. I mean, when Alexander signed it, I think he was coming off a torn ACL or some some issue for him. Maybe it was a torn ACL, but but an injury uh, that made made him miss almost the entire season before he became the highest paid corner in the NFL. If Terrell is pretty good, he should top that. Okay, so we're talking like what 22, 23 million, or, or are we pushing even further? He, he is repped by David Mulligetta, so you know that's also a factor in this conversation. What, just give me a ballpark figure. Yeah, so I think that's the range, right? So if he has an average year, I think you are getting 22. If he has, let's say he does make a Pro Bowl or an All-Pro or, or you know, get some of those flashy stats because he's playing now. I mean, look, the defense was bottom five last year in EPA per play allowed. I think we probably agree most of that is on the, the front seven uh, and lack of talent up there. Um, you know, you obviously adding Jesse Bates is, is super helpful. Some growth from the young linebackers as well. But, yeah, then if he, if he truly balls out, 
maybe you push for 23, 24. And yes, like you mentioned, the, the, the uh, one of the best agents in all of football, but in particular for secondary players like Jesse Bates, um, David Mulligetta uh, does not mess around when it comes to getting these guys new deals. Okay. So I, I look forward to, you know, seeing what that number winds up being uh, the sticker shock and, and whatnot, uh, you know, potentially a year from now uh, with AJ Terrell. But Brad, I really appreciate you coming on, sharing your insights into the Falcons draft, talking positional value, helping me walk through that whole uh, thorn bush of a topic, as well as talking about the Falcon secondary. Let the listeners know where they can find your stuff and, and maybe some of the other uh, things that you'll be getting into over at PFF over the course of the summer. Yeah, thanks much for having me. And I, and I would just say I, I get that that conversation is not fun. You have it briefly, you get it over with, and then you just look forward to the highlights. Uh, Bijan's about to put up in Atlanta. Uh, but you can follow me on Twitter at PFF underscore Brad. I'm putting out content at PFF.com. Uh, like you mentioned, uh, you know, v- veteran free agents are still out there. Some notable additions potentially uh, like a Marcus Peters. Absolutely. Well, Brad, once again, want to thank you for joining me on today's Locked on Falcons. Thank you. All right, guys, that's going to do it for us here on today's episode. Uh, tomorrow's episode, I believe, will be joined by Matt Walden to talk more about B. John Robinson. We are locked on B. John Robinson here on this podcast all summer long. And if you're tired of talking about B. John Robinson, well, that's too damn bad. OK, right. You know, uh, so we're, we're going to continue to talk about B. John Robinson. We'll get Matt's thoughts on Keelan Harris as well. The wide receiver out of Oklahoma Baptist on tomorrow's episode. We'll have um, Matt, I think, a, probably a little bit next week on to talk about the quarterback situation we might be locked on desmond ritter next week we'll we'll see how that goes um but we'll continue uh talking about Bijan robinson this week on the pod and i know some of you guys are like when when are when are the matt bergeron and and zach harrison and clark phillips you know scouting reports coming i think we'll probably get the bergeron next week as well we'll see um i'm just you know i'm feeling a little bit under the weather i'm behind on my film study all that stuff and more so um We'll get there, but you know, want to dig a little bit deeper on Bijan uh, before we move completely on to the next group of players. But uh, uh, that's in store for you on tomorrow's episode. Continue to make Locked On Falcons your first listen. Uh, of course, check out Locked On NFL Draft with uh, Damon Parson and Keith Sanchez. They are beginning their summer scouting, guys. So uh, you know, if you if you're caring about you know 2024, you want to get a heads up, uh, a leg up on that then check out the Locked On NFL Draft podcast on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. It's all part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.